very warm welcome to worship this morning. This is the second Sunday in Advent. Not many wee sleeps to Christmas now. Great. Today, again, most of the service is going to be recorded live, but some of it will be going out um, perhaps tomorrow. It's been very difficult to get it out on a Sunday. Next Sunday, 12th December at 2.30, we are to hold a cherished memory service, which will be a memorial service for those who have been bereaved in the last two years or so. Invitations have been sent out to the bereaved, at least as far as we know who they are. So if anyone has missed out, or if anyone has been bereaved in the last two years or so, then please feel that you are invited and more than welcome to be part of this service. Also, I'll invite you to send either by email to myself a few lines about the loved one who has passed away, or please be feel free to write them in this book, and I'll, I'll read out all such tributes. On the 19th December, there will be a carol service featuring the favorite carols of some of our members, and they will present them, telling us why they are their favorites. That Sunday, there will also be readings and some fun things for the kids and the big kids. There will be a watch night service here at 11.15 p.m. on Christmas Eve when we sing carols of your choice until 11.30 when we start a service of meditations and carols ending a few minutes after midnight on Christmas Day itself. Then on Boxing Day, we invite our children and adults to bring along a Christmas present to show to the congregation. Again, we'll have quizzes for adults and children with prizes. Whew, when have you heard of that in church? Of course, we'll also have carols, uh, reading of the Christmas story, and more besides. Now, on this very frosty morning, let us worship God, let us sing to His praise and glory in the bleak midwinter.
Now, Margaret's going to come and lead us in prayer, Margaret. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the God who gives us peace. This second week of Advent, help us to remember that because of Jesus, we can experience a Christmas free of turmoil and chaos. Regardless of our circumstances or situation, you offer us peace that passes all understanding. That first Christmas, when you sent your son, you sent the one who's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Even the angels cried out, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. The angels knew your purpose. They know the gifts of hope, peace, joy and love that Christmas held. They recognised the fullness of God wrapped in the flesh of an infant as you humbled yourself and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us, as the baby in the manger. That baby would grow to be the same God-man Jesus, who would again humble himself to face death on a cruel cross as payment for our sin. He would triumphantly defeat sin and death in order to cancel our debt and reconcile us to you. That is why you sent your son Jesus, because you love us. You sent Jesus that we might believe in him and receive eternal life. He was the first Christmas gift and still remains the only gift worth truly having. You exalted him and gave him a name above all names. Every knee in heaven and earth and under the earth must bow to the name of Jesus. The wind and waves obey him. He rules and reigns as king over all. No situation or circumstance that we find ourselves in is too much for him. We are able to have the fullness of peace in our hearts on Christmas Day and every day because that same Jesus sits at your right hand and makes intercession for us. He paid for our sin. He loves us with an unfathomable love and nothing can separate us from that love. Father, this second week of Advent, keep us in perfect peace as our minds stay on the truth of your perfect love. Thank you for your mighty sovereign hand. Help us to trust fully in you and rest in the peace you offer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now I've asked Margaret if she will light the second candle. And as she does that, we're going to sing verses 1 and 2 of A Candle is Burning. Thank you.
Good morning. So I've got my scarf on this morning. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Can you see who's on it? Can you see who's on it? Santa. That was a lovely birthday present from a friend. And I thought I would wear it today because I'm preparing for Christmas. So I thought I would start wearing my scarf. I've got some pictures for you, okay? You ready to see my pictures? And you can help, and all the adults will help you too, okay? I want you to have a wee look at my pictures and see, see if you can guess what it is I'm doing. Have a wee look at all those pictures. That's right, well done. I'm opening my advent calendar because I'm preparing for Christmas. Here's my second picture. Have a wee look at this. What do you think I'm doing there? You're right, well done. I'm decorating my Christmas tree. I was putting my tree up. I was putting all my decorations up and putting the lights on because I'm preparing for Christmas. I'm getting ready. Here's another picture. Oh. What do you think I'm doing there? I'm wrapping my presents. Now, I've not done that yet, but I'm going to do it because I'm preparing for Christmas. Here's another one. This one's maybe a wee bit tricky, David. I'm going to Sainsbury's. Why do you think I'm going to Sainsbury's? That's right. What do you think I'm going there for? I've got my shopping trolley. I've got my shopping list. I've got my bags. I'm going to get my... I'm going to get my shopping. But not just any shopping. That's me going to get my Christmas shopping because I'm preparing for Christmas. Here's another one. Oh. Preparing the Christmas feast. Do you like Christmas dinner? You don't, I, love, see, I love Brussels sprouts and I love my Christmas dinner. So that might be mum or gran or dad or somebody that gets all that to prepare for Christmas dinner. It might be somebody different in your house. There you go. So it's granny that prepares your Christmas dinner. But she does that because she's preparing for Christmas and she's got to get ready. Here's the last picture. Oh. Oh, that one's a bit tricky. There's the fireplace. There's a glass of milk. There's some mince pies and there's some carrots. You're right. So that's on Christmas Eve night, isn't it? And that's you getting all the things ready because you're preparing, hoping that Santa's going to come, aren't you? So you have to leave things out for Santa and for the reindeers so that they don't get too hungry. So, a long time ago, there was a man, and we read about him in the Bible. Some people thought that he was the Messiah, but he wasn't. He wasn't Jesus. He came before Jesus, and he came to prepare the way. He came to tell the people that they had to get ready for Jesus coming. They had to prepare, but he didn't mean that they had to prepare the way we do. When we're preparing for something, we get too busy and we always forget what the things that are really important are. We forget to just be still and be at peace. But John came to tell them to prepare for Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who was going to come after him and they were telling them to just, he was telling them to just stop, be at peace and prepare their hearts and get ready. He told them that the Prince of Peace was coming. So I want you, David, and everybody else to remember this year at Christmas when we're getting really busy to prepare for Christmas that we've got to just stop, be at peace and remember to get our hearts ready to remember Jesus' birth this Christmas. And David... Well done for getting all those pictures right. Well done. That was great.
<clears throat> Thanks very much, Elaine and David. <laughs> now we sing one of my favorite hymns, The Servant King. John the Baptist, um, I think we should just thank those who have decorated the church so beautifully for Christmas. Thank you very much. Now we have Alistair reading the Word of God. Good morning. Excuse me. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. 
he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one calling out in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself do not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and t I testify that this is God's chosen one. Thanks very much, Alistair reading God's word to us this morning. Now let us unite our hearts together in prayer. <clears throat> our gracious God, we rejoice that your hand has guided your people through age to age. And at this time, we as a people, we as a church, and we as a nation need your guiding hand, and we need your reviving strength. Lord, thank you for the advice of scientists, virologists, epidemiologists, immunologists, and all kinds of health specialists who seek to analyze and minimize the spread of this coronavirus in all its different forms. Give the politicians the wisdom to know how to protect their people and give the people the common sense and above all, the care for others so that the virus obtains no ground among us and fades away through lack of spreading opportunity. Lord, meanwhile, we pray comfort for all the bereaved of this virus, healing for all the victims, new vigor for the weary, and hope for all the nations. We especially remember poor nations which lack the medical facilities of the richer, richer world, especially lack the ability to buy vaccines. And we pray for your hand to be gracious in protecting them, that you might open the hearts of the rich to share with the poor, and so to be good neighbors. We remember too that hunger, cancer, heart disease, and so many other illnesses claim many more lives every year. So we pray that just as resources are concentrated on this virus, so there would be a renewed effort to combat all illnesses and conditions, so that life is better for all. Indeed, may a wave of healing sweep over our world, a wave of compassion engulf our world, and a wave of godly living break out everywhere. We especially remember all who seek refuge in our land and pray for the safety of their journey and for their success in finding a welcome and care. Lord, bless and keep safe this fellowship of believers. Help us to remain concerned for one another 
to keep in contact, to pray for health and healing. Give those in need the courage to seek help, to resist fears, to trust you for the peace and the wisdom to make good decisions and to look after their future. Remember those who are ill, some in hospital, some being cared for at home. Lord, bless all who nurse them and care for them and seek to help them in their suffering and bring them the gift of healing and of hope for the future. We remember those going through financial difficulties at this time, and especially those fearing Christmas and depressed at the thought of more debt. We do thank you for the work of Christians against poverty and the help they can give to those that ask. Help people to resist pressures to buy what they cannot afford and do not need. Bless the charities at this time when a more generous spirit prevails. We pray for believers throughout your world, so many facing unimaginable poverty, some facing the prospect of being locked forever into slavery, some persecuted for their faith, some murdered for naming the name of Christ. We especially pray for safety for believers in Iraq and Afghanistan and northern Nigeria and Sudan and North Korea and in many Muslim states which do not tolerate those of other faiths. Lord, have mercy. Grant hope to the hopeless, freedom to the captives, abundance to those with nothing, and fearless faith to all struggling with life. So, Lord, we pray your blessing on us as a family of believers as we continue in this period of Advent. May we not be too busy to miss your opportunities for service or too full of things to do to miss your quiet call to be still or to be too rushed to miss your speaking to our souls or even too earthly-minded to miss the songs of the angels and especially as they announce the entry of hope into our world and into our lives in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose mighty name we pray. Amen. Beautiful carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Let us pray. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm amazed that the preparations made prior to the visits of the heads of state to COP26. The number of police we saw in Prestwick days before the, any aircraft landed was incredible. They were all over the place, at the terminal, around the perimeter fence, even at the beach. Also on TV, we saw the roof of the armadillo, in which many of the main meetings were being held, being jet washed. What we probably didn't see was a host of painters inside sprucing up that building and all the SECC buildings as well. They say that when the queen arrives anywhere, what she must notice first is the smell of wet paint. Many years ago, she came to New College in Edinburgh for the General Assembly, and the windows, which had been a drab gray color for years, maybe even decades, suddenly became brilliant white. I suppose what we didn't see was the huge posse of Secret Service people checking out every building, every manhole, every spot along the route where the motorcades would take. Many places were actually sealed to prevent access. We often refer to these security people as the advance persons and the work they do as the advance preparation. In today's gospel reading, we encounter an advance man who is encouraging the making of advance preparation. However, he's not a member of the Secret Service. He's not checking out parade routes for, uh, just to ensure their safety. He's telling people to get ready for a visit from the most important person in human history. His name is John the Baptist, and we're told today he came as a witness to testify to the light. Now, that statement may not seem to be very much 2,000 years later, especially as it did then. That's because we already know the ending of the story, which John's hearers didn't. Our world has already been visited by the Holy One of God. We don't need an advanced person to prepare the way like he did. Or do we? Do you think we still need to listen to the message of John the Baptist? Maybe there's something in his message that we're just taking for granted. That's a problem with the familiar. We can easily do that and fall into a sense of complacency. As a result, Christmas can simply be a festival of the familiar, rather than also a wonderful opportunity for a new encounter with the Holy One of God. Now, I know there's a real desire to have this Christmas as a festival of the familiar, because so much in this last year in particular has changed. Something familiar and traditional is very reassuring. That's why I'm sure that so many started the Christmas preparations so early this year. They were saying, away with the gloom, and let's have a good old Christmas that we used to enjoy. Well, I'm into that too. I'm no straight-laced Presbyterian. I want to experience a good Christmas. But that includes the real Christmas, which is a new encounter with the Holy One of God. And Advent is the season for preparation for that spiritual reality. Four words in the message of John the Baptist stand out. In Luke's gospel, he calls for repentance and change. In John's gospel, he speaks of himself being a witness and a light. He called people to make a straight path in the desert for the Lord to travel. And these four words are the key. He is saying that preparation is required in the landscape of our lives. Think of the work that's nearly finished in constructing the new Maybole Bypass. Its route takes you over the hills behind Maybole then descends behind the town to rejoin the old road. But deep cuts have been made in the hills to help flatten the slopes. Also, you've got some stretches where clearly the level of the road has been raised, 
and you've got some nice straight bits added in, all to make a smoother road on which to travel. It's taken a lot of work and it's not quite finished yet, but the end result will be well worth it. For one thing, the views from the higher road will be spectacular. Isaiah, who prophesied the coming of John the Baptist, said that the purpose of all his construction was so that the glory of the Lord may be revealed for all the world to see. John's message about Christmas is that God wants every person in the entire world to know the power and the spectacular glory of God. Handel and his Messiah majestically captures these words of Isaiah in music. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The mouthpiece of the Lord in these days is believers, you and me. The Christmas message contains a calling that God has placed upon every one of us, a calling to live and proclaim. Now that sounds a bit heavy, but listen, it can be so much easier than cooking a Christmas dinner for a a big family or finding a present for the person who is absolutely everything. It requires preparation. Here's a hard word in the scheme of things. Repentance. And here's an even harder word. Change. If we are to succeed in the call that God has given to each of us as believers to be a witness and to be a light to others, shining with the light that Christ has put in us, then first we might need to make a change. We might need to go from dare I say, grumpy to glorious, growly to gracious, frowning to forgiving, bitter to better, self-centered to sympathetic, fearful to faithful, divisive to reconciling. Can I ask, is the Holy Spirit saying anything to anyone here this morning, touching any nerve, bringing to light something from the depths of your beings? Is he highlighting something that ought to be changed in you and in me? You know, we kind of know what it is. Like, hmm, yeah, I'm a bit grumpy. I'm a bit selfish. I'm a bit unfeeling. I need to change. But listen, you can't change on your own. You can't do it yourself. But you can where you ask God the Holy Spirit to work in, in, in you. He's causing that conflict. He wants to do that work. It may hurt a wee bit. But all the time you and I are called to go from one degree of glory to the next. Pray, come Holy Spirit, come and make me much more like the person I ought to be. Change, Lord, what you've put your finger on this morning. That will not only create better relations with those you love, better relations with yourself. Oh, that's all very well, says someone, but in my life it's others who need to change. (laughs) It's all others. It's the others who need to be reconciling towards me, not me. In that case, can I say, Very plainly, you're harboring bitterness, anger, resentment, and unforgiveness in your soul. When we do that, it harms us much more than any other person and leaves our lives in darkness. We are to be those who can change, and the Christmas message calls us to change. That will help us more than anything to experience the real Christmas. Do you remember a man called Scrooge? As one writer has put it, Christmas isn't so much about opening our presents as opening our hearts. So I challenge you as I challenge myself. Four feet above contradiction. Not six feet. Open your heart 
to the working of the Holy Spirit. Change at Christmas? Nah. Some like it the way it's always been. The way that they are used to. Well, I confess we were the same for about 20 years until our three daughters got married and we realized they had responsibilities not just to us, but to their in-laws as well. Also, with each of them having young children, they were often under pressures to stay in their homes and let their kids play with their presents rather than travel to see us. We had to face change, and we never knew until early November what or where we'd be celebrating Christmas. But you know what? Whatever way Christmas Day worked out, with us traveling or entertaining some of the family, never them all, we've always had a wonderful time. Why do I, yeah, me, and some people have to be so rigid, so selfish? We're called to die to self, to live for others, and to see others happy. Repentance and change will be required if we're truly to bring the message of Christmas home to the folks that we know and to ourselves. You see, our calling is to open up a path to God for others, others who are in need of God's love and grace. If we really hear that, it will have an effect on both our preparation and our celebration of Christmas. John the Baptist is telling us that God expects us to do something as a result of what God did at Christmas. John's saying that Christmas road building requires active involvement of every one of us, but not just at Christmas, but all year round. Although Christmas is a wonderful opportunity. He's saying we're to build these roads everywhere, in our jobs, our schools, our communities, our neighborhoods, anywhere and everywhere we go. That's the call to be a witness, a way maker for God. My old church officer, the late Jim McClurg, he had a lovely phrase when talking about living your life as a witness. He said, give them a brush with God. Repentance, change, witness, and the final word is light. Just now there's vigorous promotion of solar power because it's green energy, and that will help us to save the planet. We've come a long way technologically now in using light from the sun in that kind of energy. However, as we watch our, our TV screens and read our newspapers, which tell of the widening gulf between rich and poor, the senseless murder of innocent people, even young children, increasing numbers of those dying of drug overdoses, we've all to, to realize that technology cannot generate light for our hearts and our souls. If actions speak louder than the words, and they do, then at Christmas, God has virtually shouted to the world that he cares enough to enter the place we live and bring light into the dark areas of our lives that we cannot seem to light up on our own. Like habits, we just can't seem to break. Christmas light is about an end to the despair that comes when even our best efforts can't fix what needs fixing. And we know what that is. Christmas is about God with us, God in us. God who is the light of the world. God with us and in us to enable us to be a light to others. Christmas is also about a hope for us when life is at its darkest and the wind at its coldest and the world seemingly at its most indifferent. Christmas is about a future that God has provided when death appears to be the final word in life. There is hope for absolutely everyone. Hope for you and me. Pope Francis once said, God never, that's a great quote, God never gives someone a gift they're not capable of receiving. If he gives the gift of Christmas, it's because we all have the ability to understand and receive it. But Christmas is most truly Christmas when we celebrate it by giving the light of love to those who need it most. And they may be in our family, in our neighborhood, in our area. We need to hear this message again and again. Somehow the passage of time 
takes a subtle toll on our spirits because it happens just little by little, even to the most dedicated people. We don't usually notice it. Then one day life is dark, confusing, and we wonder, what's happened? Where's our faith? Where's that radiant faith that we used to have? That trust. Why all this worry? Why all this fear? Why all this inner conflict? This morning, we've heard from the advanced man. He reminds us that God has turned on the brightest light in the universe, brighter than any sun or star or any light from solar power. He also reminds us that we are the advanced people for Jesus for this generation. We are to tell everyone who will listen and certainly show everyone that the light has already come. We are his mission to the world. John says, prepare the way of the Lord. Or put it differently, turn on the light. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we just pray that you would work in all of our hearts, and especially in just the ways that you've highlighted to each of us today. Lord, do that work and let your light really shine through us, for we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now we're going to sing an Advent hymn called Watching, Waiting, and Longing.
resurrection. As we go through this week, may our conscience be sharpened to resist temptation, our love broadened to reach out with more care, our hope extended to lift others' spirits, our peace deepened to overcome all fear, our joy shared to increase our strength, and our faith grown to become more Christ-like. And so may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain upon each and every one of us from this day forward and forevermore.